On Fat Bear Tuesday, we conclude another gigantic Fat Bear week. The merely chubby have been winnowed away. The two fattest finalists are left, and they are quintessential examples of success, adaptation, and survival in the bear world. This is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with explore.org. Happy Fat Bear Week and happy Fat Bear Tuesday, everyone. Joining me today are my co-hosts. I'm joined by three Katmai National Park Rangers, and I'll introduce them one at a time because I have a question for each one of them that I want them to answer. I'll start with uh, <laughs> Park Ranger Naomi Boke on your screen, who is uh, to my right. Naomi, how are you today? I'm very well. Happy Fat Bear Tuesday. So the, uh, the question I have for the Rangers is, and you first, Naomi, is how'd your bracket predictions turn out this Fat Bear Week? Not very well. <laughs> <laughs> not very well. I'm glad I'm not a betting person because I would have lost a lot of money. I think there were a lot of surprises for me in this bracket. <laughs> and uh, just below Naomi on your screen is Catman National Park Ranger Chris Kleesrath. Chris, great to have you along today. I think maybe your first on-camera live chat for the year. Is that correct? It is true. Yes. I'm more of a behind the scenes type person, but I uh, appreciate you guys asking me to join you tonight. And how'd your bracket turn out? Um, it was doing pretty well. I, I, I'm i wondering how it's going to turn out tonight, though. <laughs> I, may, I may lose tonight. <laughs> All right, I'll leave it at that. And then finally, uh, Kat, my uh, National Park Ranger Felicia Jimenez is with us as well. She's right below me on your screen. Felicia, how are you today? I'm doing well. Yeah, happy Fat Bear Tuesday. And did your uh, bracket prediction for Fat Bear Week uh, turn out well, or did you find some surprises in it? <laughs> um, I probably should have put money on my bracket because it did pretty well. <laughs> we'll see about today, but <laughs> I haven't lost yet. <laughs> yeah, I mine did pretty well too, except I, di I actually didn't think Grazer was going to beat 747, even though I endorsed Grazer for Fat Bear Week. So I think that's my main mistake. Otherwise, things are kind of going well for me, but not really actually. So um, I, th I think I'm like maybe only picked like half <laughs> half the winners in there. So if anybody's at home like, oh, well, the, the Rangers and, and Mike, they obviously must be able to pick uh, the winners uh, accurately. <laughs> no way. So there's always, no. yeah, there's always surprises <laughs> in Fat Bear Week. But we're, we're here, we're really here to talk about the two fattest bears on Brooks River this year as chosen by the public, as well as the bears journeys to achieve success. We'll also take a look back at Fat Bear Week 2023 and take a look closer look at what fat means to the two finalists and what's in store for them as they enter winter hibernation. Uh, Fat Bear Week voters have also asked us how they can support Katmai National Park. And a great way to do that is through the annual Otis Fund fundraiser for the Katmai Conservancy. The Katmai Conservancy is the official uh, friends group of Katmai National Park, and its mission is to support the efforts of the National Park Service to protect and manage uh, the park landscape. So Explode.org has generously agreed to match donations to the Otis Fund during Fat Bear Week, and you can find out more at katmaiconservancy.org. Thanks to everybody who has donated so far. Uh, we're coming up on the end of Fat Bear Week, though. We actually just have a couple of more hours left in the vote for the final match. Uh, but let's start, I guess, with the basics, as we always like to do. Uh, Felicia's, um, I think this is a good time to re recap what Fat Bear Week is and what happened so far. So maybe, well, yeah, we'll start with you. Uh, you just tell us uh, the basics of Fat Bear Week. Yeah, yeah. So Fat Bear Week is Katmai's <laughs> annual uh, celebration of success and resilience in our brown bears. Um, so that manifests itself as a bracket style tournament where we pit bears in head to head and belly to belly matchups um, against one another. It started on October 4th um, and has gone throughout the week with different matchups every day of voting except for Sunday. And today is the final. Um, we finally winnowed down to just two finalists um, today for the winner of the Fat Bear Week champion. Um, so yeah, today's a great day to celebrate and the voting is open. You, the public get to pick which bear exemplifies fatness the best. You can go transformation, you can go biography, 
you can just go by which picture do you like more? I don't know. Um, but you <laughs> get to pick which bear is your winner. Um, so, Chris, how can the people participate in this super fun tournament? Well, voting is easy. You just go to fatbearweek.org um, by 5 p.m. Alaska time, 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, pick your favorite fat bear, enter your email address, click on the bear, and uh, make sure you hit the check the box for the robot, and hit enter, and it'll <laughs> register your vote. So don't, you still have a little time, so make sure you get in there and let us know who you want. Yeah, still a little less than two hours to vote. So if you haven't done so yet, get over there and do it uh, right now. Uh, but, um, you know, it's been a, a long road for these bears, not only in the Fat Bear Week tournament, but of course the work that they put in during the summer. Uh, but I think uh, it's, it's always fun to kind of take a look back at our Fat Bear events at the end of the year and and see what happened, how we got to this point with the two final bears. Uh, Naomi, do you want to introduce us to uh, sort of like the road to Fat Bear Week? Yeah, um, well, the road to Fat Bear Week um, starts um, in the early spring when the bears are coming out of hibernation and um, they, they need to fatten up to uh, survive the next hibernation. Um, but to be in Fat Bear Week, um, the bears need to show up in both the spring and the late summer. Um, then we rangers need to get profile pictures of the bears in the spring and in the late summer. And also as interpretive rangers, we really like good stories. So um, the bears this, this year had to develop some good stories, which they did um, for us to bring them into the bracket. And um, there were a variety of stories for us to tell. And the routes to success in this year's Fat Bear Week were really as varied as the bears themselves. And I think voters really rewarded that variety of success. They didn't just vote for the, you know, this one big guy or this one charismatic girl. So um, let's, let's take the journey starting with Fat Bear Jr. Chris, um, what happened in Fat Bear Jr. this year? Well, this year's competition marks a third year for Fat Bear Jr. And I think everyone really enjoys it. It began in 2021. It quickly became an excellent way to recognize the challenges and achievements of our tubby cubbies. Um, 806 Jr. quickly went from tot to Titanic tank and took the crown, but the other competitors gave their all. Uh, we had our situation with the sister slash cousins competing against each other, uh, while 806 Junior took on the 901 Spring Cubs. Pound for pound, these cubs gained the highest percentage of body weight in the whole Fat Bear Week contest, especially the Spring Cubs who were born at one pound and can be over 70 pounds by season's end. 806 Junior sure earned his spot and moved on to the first round of the Fat Bear Week bracket. What about the first round of Fat Bear Week, Mike? Yeah, we started uh, Fat Bear Week on October 4. Uh, we started out with 12 bears. Uh, four of those bears got buys to the second round automatically, and eight met in first round matches. Uh, as you said, you mentioned Chris, eight of the Spring Cub was in it, and the Spring Cub trounced uh, the sub adult bear. Uh, four, I think, you know, nearly 10 on uh, margin. And the Spring Cub this year had many moments of uncertainty as it tried to navigate the river alongside its mother. 428 is an offspring of 128 Grazer, who uh, and 428 was learning to survive on her own for the first time. So this is her first summer on her own. Two mother bears, uh, 402 and 901, met in a different match. They are on opposite end of the maternal experience spectrum. 402 is raising an eighth litter while 901 is raising her first litter. Voters thought 901's story and waistline were more compelling, and she won that first round. Beatdown that Grazer voters gave to 151 Walker, uh, they matched up in the first round, and Grazer beat Walker, uh, again, by a 10 to 1 margin. I thought Grazer was going to win that match. I didn't think it would be that large, and that's a big difference uh, in the vote, 10 to 1. Of course, Walker has deferred to Grazer for much of the summer. He remembers her strength, 
strength and ferocity. It seems that voters recognize that too, along with uh, Grazer's change in body mass. And then the final first round match was between 284, a single adult female with a long family legacy at Brooks River, and 164, an upcoming and innovative young adult male. While the vote wasn't close in this of the first round with uh, 164 by about 37,000 votes. So we got rid of four uh, bears in the first two days of Fat Bear Week, and uh, those um, those winners advanced to the second second round. And Felicia, as we moved on to the second round, I think there could have been some surprises and maybe some matchups that were easily predictable. Yeah, so um, the second round really tested voters with a bunch of tough match <laughs> matchups, if I say myself. Um, if we look at Friday, um, one of the toughest matchups was um, 901 making it past 402 um, and going against the beloved 480 Otis. Um, it's a super tough matchup. Everybody was torn between going for the mama who's had a tough year versus 480. Look at those transformation photos. Um, but ultimately 901 um moved on and she won against otis though he did put up a really great fight um and then the other uh matchup of friday was an outrageous um, matchup between two bears that were so different on the size spectrum we had our lovely 806 junior um the spring cub versus the one of the biggest boars on the river 32 chunk um which that was surprising to me um seeing such an ridiculously outsized matchup um but both of them were very loved got a lot of love but overall um 32 <laughs> he made it um and moved on to become one of our semi-finalists um, and then Saturday, we also had some tough matchups right out the gate. Um, we had 128 uh, Grazer versus 747. And this match was super surprising to me with just how <laughs> like much of a sweep um, 128 had. Um, they, you, if you look at both of the photos, they both have amazing transformations. Um, I think they both did really, really well. They're both really big bears. They're both dominant bears. Um, they've definitely met up with each other in the river this season. Um, but it was a complete sweep by 128, which was so surprising to me. Um, and then the other matchup of the second round on Saturday was uh, Bear 164 versus 435 Holly. Um, and yeah, he is a, uh, what's it called? He's a young, a young male, um, actually has quite a bit of a fan club, uh, but he did really well in his first round, but he couldn't stand up against Holly. Um, she was described as a monstrous marshmallow, um, of a, of a bear. Uh, and ultimately Holly was the one who was victorious in this matchup and made it to our semifinals, which, um, so many tough matches. Yeah, so Naomi, do you want to describe um, what went on in the semifinal with our final four? Yeah, the semifinals were really interesting this year because three out of four of the contestants were were sows. So the big boars may dominate the river, but they don't dominate Fat Bear Week anymore. So um, 32 Chunk was put up against 901. And um, 32 Chunk just crushed 901. Sorry, dear, you're a wonderful bear. But um, Chunk got twice the number of votes as 901. So, but 901, she's got another chance next year. So does, you know, so, so Chunk can move on. But the other matchup was 128 Grazer against Holly. This was a really tough matchup for me. I am so fond of both of these bears. And Grazer is a tough girl. She um, defends herself um, and uh, fishes all over the place. Holly, um, she's just very single-minded, very chill. 
She never gets out of the water. She fishes constantly, but all that fishing didn't help her defeat 128 Grazer. Grazer got four times the votes that Holly got. Now that surprised me a little bit because Holly uh, did become a monstrous marshmallow of a bear, um, but um, she will definitely be prepared for the winter. So now we're down to the final showdown, 128 Grazer versus 32 Chunk. And, um, you know, it's been such an interesting week and I'm sure that everyone has a favorite Fat Bear Week moment or two. Um, actually, Felicia alluded to mine, which is I loved the matchup between 32 Chunk, who is a Brodignagian behemoth of a bear. Um, and he went up against his mini me, that tough little tank of a cub 806 junior and when and when you and when you see them i mean you know 806 junior does look like chunks mini me now the other thing was that i don't think you can call it a favorite moment for me but i was very surprised when 128 beat 747 so um those were kind of um highlights for me felicia what was your favorite fat bear week moment um, I don't know if I can pinpoint an exact favorite moment, but I've loved seeing the spirit of Fat Bear Week and just seeing everyone rally behind their favorite bear. Um, and uh, what's it called all the social media, like me and Naomi and Chris see all of our social, like Cat My social media. Um, that's also part of our job. We see the comments um, in the Facebook and the Instagram posts and the silly. Um, Instagram stories where you're tagging Cat My National Park, like we see them. <laughs> Some of the comments just like actually have me cracking up <laughs> when I'm going through them. So I think those are some of my favorite moments through Fat Bear Week. Um, what about you, Mike? Yeah. Oh, and I should mention too, um, if, if the audience, you know, if you're watching right now in the chats and you want to talk about your favorite Fat Bear Week moment, uh, or part of Fat Bear Week, then, then drop those comments in the chat. So I'll be interested to read those after the broadcast today. Uh, but yeah, to piggyback off of what you said, uh, Felicia, um, I, I love the campaigning. I think every year for me, it's it's how people campaign for the bear that they think is most deserving of the vote, the most successful and fattest bear of the year. It's everything from the campaign posters and memes to the heartfelt testimonials in uh, the bear camp comments and on social media. And I think it shows that people are paying attention. They're considering the merits of each bear and especially their stories of like challenge and hardship and success. And those are different experiences uh, for, for each bear. Uh, Chris, what about you? What's been um, your favorite Fat Bear Week moment so far? I don't think I can pin it down to just one. I have to say my favorite thing to do is like Felicia, go through the comments and see those. But what I enjoy are the posts from teachers sharing how they've incorporated Fat Bear Junior and Fat Bear Week into their curriculum. Uh, their classes pick their favorite bears in the brackets. They create their own campaign posters, and they even at times vote as a class. Uh, what a great way to spread our important messages about conservation and protection of the environment to the next generation. It appears that schools are responsible for about 30% of the votes. So it makes me feel good that we're reaching out and that the children are learning uh, how important it is to conserve and um, and plus we get to share our bears with them and i think that that's a favorite part for me is to see how much the children are getting to participate in it um, but let's move on to the stars of the show the finalists what can you tell us about 32 chunk felicia oh yeah so 32 chunk um one of our finalists this year he is a massive massive bear the big boy himself um, and honestly, in my opinion, he is probably the largest male on the river. Um, this is also probably the biggest that he's, he's been so far that we've seen. Um, so he's had a really, really good year. Um, he even came out of hibernation huge. Um, so yeah, I mean, he started off big. He had a really good year. Um, the hierarchy was pretty fluid this year and we saw Chunk, um, coming in and out, um, you know, jostling for hierarchy space between, you know, him and 747, 856. He's one of the most dominant males on the river. Um, 
And even though he started out big, his weight gain still was huge. Um, and for this giant bear um, who is so big, you know, they have to gain weight to survive winter hibernation. And he is set up so well um, for the next year. Um, he's he's going to do super great. Um, so, Mike, you want to tell us maybe what do you think next year is going to look like for Chunk? Yeah, he worked really hard this summer to get fat, as all of the bears have done. And the whole purpose of the bears' efforts to get fat are to prepare them for hibernation. Bears hibernate to meet the winter's challenges, and in order to do so, they express some of the most remarkable survival adaptations among mammals. So Chunk's life in the den coming up, you know, maybe next month, maybe in December, it depends uh, on maybe a variety of things, how well fed he is, whether, you know, the weather's warm, stuff like that. But it's, you know, when he goes into the den for, for good, his life there is probably restful, but it's not like a normal sleep. Uh, his heart rate will drop to about 10 beats a minute. He'll take only two or three breaths a minute. His metabolism will decline to a level that's maybe 75% lower than his summertime metabolism. He won't eat or drink. He won't urinate or defecate. Instead, he'll use his body fat as a fuel to stay warm and to create water to keep him hydrated. Uh, and he'll even be able to use his bones or, or keep his bones and muscles healthy and strong without exercise. So that's um, an experience that he'll have in the den. And that's a, a common experience for all brown bears that are hibernating. They possess those amazing abilities. But after uh, Chunk comes out of the den in the springtime, his story is going to maybe differ than some of the other bears. Uh, because springtime can be a tough season for bears. There's often little food available for them. Uh, so when Chunk emerges from the den in spring, he'll need any leftover fat reserves to provide him with energy, especially when the mating season begins in late spring. The bigger he is during that time, the more competitive he will be in the mating game. And, you know, when we look at Chunk's low hanging belly and ample hindquarters, um, it, I mean, it really bears the fruit of his summertime success. So he's done really well. He's a deserving finalist in Fapper Week this year. He's an amazing bear in many ways. Uh, but his experience is not representative of all bears. Um, Naomi, let's uh, turn to uh, Chunk's competitor in the Fapper Week finale right now. Uh, how does Grazer's experience differ from Chunk? Um, differs a lot. Um, I loved watching Grazer this summer. Um, Grazer is probably best known for being a very aggressive, dominant female when she has cubs. I mean, no one wants to get in her way. Um, at least if they want to survive. Um, but Grazer was single this year. And, um, you know, she had no cubs to defend and feed. So she could just concentrate on herself and and job one, which is getting fat. And she did a great job of doing that. Um, she's probably the best angler on the river. I mean, she can successfully fish almost anywhere. I mean, she began the season with riffles which is um, where she usually begins um, her season. Um, she was catching more fish than any other bear that I saw um, at the Riffles. And then she moved to the falls and there she was fishing on the lip. She was in the office. She was at the conveyor belt. Um, and sometimes she had to compete for those spots, but she was catching a lot of fish and it showed. And in late summer, we really didn't see a lot of grazer. And that's very common. We don't, she's very cryptic and hard to find um, at the end of the season. So kudos to um, any rangers who got photo um, photos of her at the end of the season. But this summer, we saw her fishing at night, thanks to our infrared uh, on the cams at the falls. So um, I guess success means um, fishing 24 hours a day. Um, and she's also seen at the headwaters of Lake Brooks. So busy girl um, taking care of herself and getting fat. Um, so she, although she's not as aggressive as she as this summer as she is when she has cubs, she's still one of the most dominant bears on the river. And the way that I can tell that is the way 747 treats her. 
because 747, especially this summer, was trying to um, maintain his dominance. And um, he would not let 128 Grazer get near him. Now, he doesn't do that. He doesn't posture with every bear. Um, he really saves that posturing for the bears he's concerned about, the bears he thinks of as dominant. I mean, for instance, 164 um, could fish right alongside of 747. So um, the fact that he was worried about Grazer and would not let her near him really tells me how dominant she was. And um, being a smart bear, she um, was selective about how she used her dominance. If she were in a fishing spot that was productive, she would hold on to it by pushing the other bear out. Most often it was 151 Walker. But if the fishing spot wasn't so productive, she would save her energy and just, eh, well, that other bear can, can fish there. So she's been very successful this summer. And, um, you know, what does that mean for her in the den next year? Chris? Obviously, our finalist has gained sufficient weight to make it through the winter. Um, she will experience the same things that Mike talked about, uh, the reduced heart rate, not eating, not drinking, defecating, urinating. But she was spotted courting, being courted by a few of the boars. So that leads to it's possible that she could wind up giving birth in the den. So because bears experience delayed implantation, when she gets into the den, if her body feels it's sufficiently prepared, um, the embryos will implant. And around February or January, she'll give birth to one, two, maybe three cubs. Uh, we're all excited anytime Grazer um, gives us some cubs to look at. Um, and she'll deliver them and she'll nurse in the den and uh, they're one of the latest ones to emerge from the den. But if uh, she does, she'll emerge and she'll take care of the cubs once she comes out of the den. Uh, if not, she'll have a nice quiet return to the river ready for another single girl summer. So <laughs> it's, we really don't know what'll happen for her in the den because we're not sure, uh, but we'll look forward to seeing if she does emerge with cubs. And if not, then uh, we're happy that she has another uh, self-care year for herself um, when she gets back from her hibernation. Felicia, what does the rest of the season look like? Yeah, so um, this this time of year, it's gonna start to signal um, the end of the salmon run. And we know the bears are really there for one thing, um, and that's the salmon run. Um, so days are gonna start to get shorter, um, but the salmon have effectively at this point ended their life cycle. Um, there are still salmon around. Um, the, you know, the bears will continue to pick off the dead and dying salmon, but they've effectively made their goal. Um, so the salmon have, you know, ended their life cycle. Um, the spawned, um, you know, they have spawned. The embryos will start to develop um, throughout the winter. It takes about three months. Um, they'll develop in those little gravel reds. Um, and then in the spring, the eggs will hatch and salmon fry will emerge. And these fry are, you know, gonna hang out um, in fresh water for about a year or so. Um, and then after that year, they will make their first migration out towards um, the sea. And sockeye salmon spend about two to three years in the sea. Um, and then they come back and return to freshwater to start that cycle all over again. So um, we'll see these, you know, these sockeye that have been, you know, the eggs that make it and, you know, a few years from now. Um, so they have quite a long journey to start. Um, and then once again, they'll start that cycle, they'll come, they'll run up, they'll spawn, and then the bears will once again um, pick off the dead and dying salmon around late October, early November. Um, and so then this time of year, this is when the bears are doing that. So they're picking off the dead and dying salmon. Um, and then around this time of year, end of the month, maybe next month too, um, they'll start to head and find a den site to prepare for hibernation. Um, so Mike, do you want to tell everybody what that next step for the bears is? <laughs> We, yeah, we touched on, um, you know, the some of the physiological and metabolic changes that bears experience when they're inside of the den. 
but uh, hibernation isn't an on off switch for bears. It's just not something that happens quickly. They experience long, long low transition to enter the for winter. In fact, the metabolic slowdown has likely begun already for many bears in Katmai. Uh, more than three weeks before a bear enters its den, its heart rate, body temperature, and overall activity begins to slow down. Uh, just before a bear enters its den, its body temperature and heart rate decline sharply, and the transition continues for several more weeks. It bottoms out in late fall or early winter, depending on when the bear started uh, hibernation. And where are they going when they're going to their dens? Uh, to date, there haven't been any studies that have specifically tracked uh, where cat mice bears, uh, but we have we can make some educated guesses um, from studies in other areas. Um, you know, most of cat mice bears enter their dens in November, but there's quite a bit of variation. Some could enter their den as late as October, uh, as early as late October, excuse me. And um, on average, pregnant females and females with cubs enter the den before other bears. Adult males usually enter their dens last and sometimes not until December. So it's much more likely that grazer is gonna be going into the den before chunk this year, but there's quite a bit of variability. There's always some females that go into the den after some adult males are already in their den. Where are they going to? Uh, we don't know specifically where the individual bears from Brooks River. They, uh, from Brooks River, bears travel to the nearby mountains to find a good den site. And bears in Katmai dig dens on steep, well-drained and well-vegetated slopes in places that collect and hold a lot of snow. A steep slope allows a bear to dig straight into the hillside rather than down, so it lessens its workload. The roots of plants help stabilize the den structure and well-drained soils reduce the chance of a den flooding during a warm spell or thaw in the winter. Finally, snow insulates the den from cold, or cold winter air temperatures. And the bears in, in Katmai are believed to dig new dens each year. I know that's a question that uh, people commonly wonder, do they go back to the same dens? And we don't think that they do. Uh, the toll uh, for dens uh, last more than typically, and the bedrock doesn't form caves or other shelters that a bears could use as a den. So we think they're digging and preparing new dens every fall. Uh, overall, the hibernating bears, it's really a, a remarkable creature uh, through instinct and learned skill and their energetic savings account, which is body fat. They find shelter and they find comfort even as they experience a month long famine. And we see many successful bears over the years at Brooks River in Katmai. We've seen it, we've seen it in the past. So as we head to towards the conclusion of Fat Bear Week and our live chat today, I want to take a, a look back quickly at where it all started, uh, because the first Fat Bear Week event 14 on Katmai's Facebook page, people voted with their likes or their reactions. And that day, there were a total of 1,693 votes, and Otis became the first Fat Bear winner. Uh, so he won by uh, 38 votes over Bear 410, a bear who is no longer seen at Brooks River. But uh, for those of us who knew her, uh, she was a large bear known for napping and um, also orchestrating long bear jams at the old floating bridge. Uh, the 2014 event was so well received that I knew it had to be expanded to a whole week to allow more people to participate. And the first first uh, full uh, Fat Bear Week was in 2015. And it, and it's bloated popularity. Uh, part of some Fat Bear Week events. Uh, this is not your first uh, your first um, Fat Bear Week. Uh, so, how has the um, the 2022 Fat Bear Week compare and 2023 Fat Bear Week compare to maybe that first Fat Bear event in 2014? Well, to say it's grown is an understatement. Starting with, as you mentioned, about 1,600 votes in 2014 to over a million last year. Fat Bear has become a favorite part of the fall season. Last year alone, we received votes from every continent, over 100 countries, and they came from a wide range of age groups. So there's no typical voter. Um, everyone seems to enjoy Fat Bear Week. Um, this year, we've already surpassed last year's numbers, having reached a million votes before the semifinals. The increased popularity and participation are great news since it not only means that people are enjoying the contest, but we're able to spread our important messages about conservation and maintaining a healthy ecosystem all over the world. Not to mention sharing our fat bears and salmon. Um, it's still a great time 
that's had by all and it just continues to grow and um there's still time to be part of it if you haven't voted a little plug um and i think that it will continue to grow as i think we've seen an increase in interviews it seems to be popping up on the news uh, a lot more often even than it did last year so uh, felicia you want to share how they can still be a part of this I, it's a record-breaking year already oh yeah so um it's not it's not over yet this is your last chance to vote in the final um we have about a little over you know a little under an hour and a half left so you can still get your vote in if you haven't done it yet um will you choose between 128 grazer or 32 chunk um, and the exciting thing is you can go to factoryweek.org right here. I'll look at that. I can point to it <laughs> um, to get in that last minute vote. Um, and the exciting thing about this year is that both of the finalists are first time finalists. Um, this is the first time either of them have ever made it this far in a Fat Bear Week competition. So no matter what, no matter which bear wins, um, we will have a new Fat Bear Week champion to add to the lineup. So that's super exciting. Become a part of this. Um, throw your vote in if you haven't yet. One more last plug to fatbearweek.org. Um, so, yeah, get in. Um, and I think we have a little bit of time for some audience questions. Do. Yeah, I actually, I forgot to mention it in the broadcast that were some audience questions. We have some that came in in advance. Uh, thanks to everybody who did that. We have some that came in during um, the broadcast. And thanks to everybody at Explode.org who's helping to monitor those, those questions for us. I think maybe um, a simple one that we can get to, this one came in advance, um, is the uh, first one that I have on the queue, the winning fat bear get rewarded with anything. Uh, you know, this is a question that people do ask about. They wonder, yeah, what are the bears getting out of this? So I don't, I don't know who I should direct this question to, um, but yeah, Rangers, uh, what are the bears getting out of this event? Well, Nothing. they don't get an answer. <laughs> no, they don't get an agent and a contract, but they do get a really nice six months of hibernation and um, and then to come out healthy in the spring. I think they also get a, an opportunity for people to learn more about them and maybe know how to take better care of them um, going forward. So it is recognition of people understanding what it takes to make it through hibernation. And um, so they get to be the spokesperson for uh, the next year as far as uh, what we want people to learn about them. Yeah, they're not getting, uh, you know, any any food rewards or anything like that. They're only getting our admiration. But I, yeah, like you, like you said, I do hope that, uh, that they're getting uh, increased support for, you know, their homes, for national parks, for wildlands, for sustainable fisheries and salmon populations, because there's you know there's a lot of chunk-like bears out there. Uh, there's some grazer-like bears out there on the landscape that are living in different places. There's Otis-like bears doing Otis-like things elsewhere, um, and they need <laughs> our support um, as, as well. Uh, this is a, an interesting question, and I think maybe each one of us can try to take an opportunity to answer this. Uh, somebody was wondering, do you have any shins? of what we may see next season based on what took place this season. Mm -hmm. I'll start, I'll give you an opportunity to think about this. Uh, I'll start with saying, you know, I, I, was, I was surprised by the dominance of Chunk this year. I mean, he's always been a really big bear, but he always, he hasn't always uh, asserted him, himself like in the top of the hierarchy. Um, the, but this year he clearly challenged 747 a number of times. He was more dominant than 747. I'm curious to see if that pattern continues. And then also 856 last year, or this year, excuse me, uh, was at the top of the hierarchy again. And he's in his early 20s. He's been dominant for more than 10 years on average. So he's, you know, an extremely successful bear. The hierarchy is one of the, the things that I like to follow most at, at Brooks Falls, especially in July. So I'm looking forward to seeing how those things shake out next year. I'm wondering if there's going to be any bear that's going to challenge Chunk or 747 or 856 next year, because they're all giants still. And there's a lot of young males that are kind of in, 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 the, in the river, but they haven't shown the propensity or um, 
or maybe the assertiveness to challenge any of those bears. So I, I don't know what's going to happen with them, but that's a story that I am following. Uh, Naomi, you're right below me, so maybe we'll just go next to you. What are uh, your predictions uh, for next yeah. year? Well, I, I like you, I love to watch the hierarchy and it was so fluid this year. Um, it kept going back and forth, so definitely something to watch. Um, I'm really interested in what happens to um, the 909 and 910 families because um, 910 and 909 are sisters. They started last season raising their cubs together, which we've never seen. And when 909's uh, two and a half year old was became independent and 909 was then courted by males, 909's uh, two and a half year old thought, hmm, I had a good thing going with auntie and cousin. I think I'm gonna hang out with them and um, was adopted by 910. So um, will 910 um, boot out both cubs for independence? Um, will the cousins um, seek each other's company for uh, security? Because once they're on their own, it's a whole different world. They don't have the protection of, of mom or, you know, in 909's junior's case, uh, amp. So I'm very interested in following that story. What about you, Felicia? Um, I am, well, I'm excited also to follow the hierarchy um, and just looking at the bears that are set up well for hibernation now, like 32 is huge. Um, and I think he's going to come out of hibernation also still huge. Um, he's probably going to show up and we're going to be like, oh my God, this bear hibernated for <laughs> he was asleep and didn't eat. Um, and this is a third of his body weight loss. He's still huge. Um, it will be interesting to see how that shifts um, and how the salmon run will affect that this year. Um, I'm also interested to see what female bears, single female bears come back with cubs next year. Um, if 909 comes back with cubs, that would be interesting and fun to see. Um, if the 910 cousins do get booted out and will they, see, you know, like Naomi was saying, are they going to stick together um, or will they go their separate ways? Um, and 128 had a great year. Um, I would love to see mm -hmm. some little blonde-eared babies running around. <laughs> I love her ears. She's my um, wallpaper background for my bath. <laughs> for my computer. Um, so to see some more of those little puff balls ears would be great. Um, but it's just going to be and watch super out. interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be so fun. Um, but yeah, it will it that that is something I like watching the family groups quite a bit. So getting to see the females that come back with cubs and the you know, cubs that return as yearlings or even two and a half year olds, um, seeing what they're going to be um, like next year. Um, what about you, Chris? I kind of stole mine. I was going to say 909 and uh, 128. I'm hoping they come back with some pretty cubs. Uh, but overall, I think I'm interested to see how the salmon run compares to this year. It seemed to be a little late this year. Um, I want to see if the bears act differently, if it shows up earlier um, and not for nothing, but my bear, uh, I didn't get to see her this year and I'm hoping that 854 shows back up with her beautiful little cub um, and hopefully that they're doing well. But overall, I just, I'm curious to see how things change if the salmon run um, increases over what it was this year or comes earlier. A lot of things to talk about and uh, a lot of uh, storylines to follow for next year. Uh, another question that we had coming in from our live audience, uh, this uh, person wrote in, I would love to ask what the Rangers and Mike think both of our finalists might weigh. Uh, so I would love for you to ask as well. Uh, moving on. Uh, actually, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so I... <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to throw out some numbers here. It's only ballpark. We don't know this for sure. You know, we can just maybe base it on um, some past studies that have been done in, in other parts of North America or coastal Alaska. Maybe, you know, we can extrapolate from some of the LIDAR um, experimentation that was going on at Brooks River a few years ago, where they found like, um, 
you know, I, what I would consider to be like a medium uh, sized adult female or, or a medium large adult female like Divot, she was like more than 600 pounds in the fall in or like in late September. So I would say that Grazer is definitely 600 plus pounds, maybe, maybe exceeding 700 pounds easily. I think Chunk is definitely like a 1200 pound bear. Uh, what do you think? I mean, we know that our, our, our bears at, at, at Katmai are some of the largest in the world, but we don't have a precise estimate for, uh, for these bears. Well, I mean, we just have to get Michael Saxton to put them on a, on a, on a scale. That's all. Um, but I don't know. I think I, Grazer is a big female. So she could be over 700 pounds. I mean, if you, you look at Holly, who is a giant bear right now, what in the beginning of the season, you, you I'm taken aback at how small she is. Grays are not so small. She's thin in the beginning of the season, but not so small. So um, I think that uh, she could be well over uh, 700 pounds. And I don't know, Chunk is just outsized. I think he's more than 1,200 pounds. Yeah, he definitely could be plus 1,200 pounds. You know, when you read about um, descriptions of bears, you know, generally people overestimate their body size. They'll be like, oh, I saw this bear. It was monstrous. And it's like a three-year-old black bear. And, the, and there was like, oh, it must have weighed 500 pounds. And it probably only weighed like 100 or 150 or something like that. Uh, but with the, the brown bears and Katmai, again, if you're seeing those big adults like Chunk and 856 and 747, you are certainly seeing 1,000 pounds plus bears, uh, but we just don't know specifically what they might weigh because uh, we don't have scales along the river. But maybe one day we'll be able to use different technology to get better estimates of their body mass. I think that's something to work towards and look forward to. Uh, this is an interesting question and, and definitely for the three of you more, more than me, uh, somebody was wondering, are there any bears seen either uh, in the summer or only in the fall that you wish you could have included in uh in fat bear week yes uh, uh yeah <laughs> so who who might who might that be Naomi? we'll start with you well at the top of my list is bear 503 who um could who i think could be the next king of katmai um he's got the genes for it he's huge um bear 503 is um he usually comes in July and comes back in September. He didn't show up until late summer this year. And of course he came back huge. So I don't know where he has been, but he looks great. And of course my favorite bear, 89 backpack, because he's the one that got me addicted to the bear cams. Um, he really got fat this year and was there in July and late summer, but just couldn't get those fat pictures of him at the end of the season. He just showed up a little bit late, but I'm sure Felicia and Chris have other bears that they wish they had seen at both ends of the season. Um, 854 for sure for me. And she's usually there in the spring and the fall, but she didn't uh, come back in the fall this year. Um, and is it 469 Morse the, uh, with the long neck? Eight um, Mac and I saw him in the river the other night. Um, I don't remember what his number is, but I was, would like to see what he looks like in the spring before he puts on all his weight. <laughs> yeah, oh, we've, we've never um, seen um, eight, eight, seven, nine in the, in the, in early summer. So it would be really cool to okay, see what seven. he looks like in the, in, yeah, in, in July. Sorry to interrupt you, Felicia, but yeah, what, what were you thinking? Which, which bear? would you have liked to see if you if you could you know just choose any bear <laughs> i have i think i'll call them my heartbreak bears <laughs> but this this bear that uh i wish i really wish i could have gotten a fat photo of bear 230 to be one of the young adults like in the bracket i love him so much but only only early summer photos i couldn't get a late season photo and then on the reverse end of that um 602 was a huge bear oh my gosh he was so he was. surprisingly huge i was like oh my god i saw that bear at the falls when i was actually trying to get photos of 32 and i was like 
oh my god who is this bear and then you know got photos just in case um trying to you know go through and see if there was an early summer picture but um you know he's only really a fall bear i think he was very briefly um at brooks river in the summer and did not get an early season photo of him but we tried <laughs> And I'm glad you mentioned 602 because yeah, some Bear Camp fans were wondering that. Like, why wasn't he in the mm -hmm. tournament this year? Or they were hoping that he was. So yeah, thanks for mm -hmm. letting us know that you were you were trying and maybe he could have <laughs> been a, a competitor had he hung around a little bit more in early summer. Uh, you know, we do have a question, of course, about maybe Brooks River's most famous bear, uh, Otis. Somebody was wondering, do you think Otis gained enough weight to do hibernation? Uh, we were at the river a lot more this summer than I was, and you were there when Otis showed up this year. So um, maybe uh, if you want to talk about like uh, Felicia and Naomi, I think you both went to the falls maybe. I, and Chris, I don't know if you did this the day Otis showed up, but maybe you could talk about what he looked like then versus what he looks like now and how that sets him up for success in the winter. Well, I mean, I, I did go to see him at, at the falls and he looked skinnier and more frail than I've ever seen him. I mean, his ribs were showing, his hips were showing. And as you've said a couple of times, Mike, he, he couldn't have been eating very much before he got to the river. Um, he looks good now. I mean, he, um, he did his usual Zen fishing, um, eat more, move less, did a lot of napping and caught a lot of fish. And um, I don't know, Felicia, when you saw him at the end of the season, how did he look to you? Yeah, this bear always surprises me. Um, he, I saw him the first day he came to the river and um, very surprised at just how skinny he was. Um, but I mean, immediately when I got there, he had already caught like three fish or something within that like short time span that I was there. And the thing about Otis is like, if you watch him, he'll always be staring at this or be at the same spot. And then I'll, I won't even like look away. But then all of a sudden he has a fish in his mouth. Like, where did that come from? Um, so he always surprises me. And then, you know, he was gone for a little bit. He wasn't seen as often. Um, and then, you know, later on in later summer, um, he looked great. Um, I don't know where he was at or what he was doing, but he was he was eating. Um, he looks really, really good. I mean, even when like he was swimming around um, in the river and it was getting his like late season photos, um, he was still like how did he get that fish? Like I looked away for a second, there was a fish in his mouth. So I think he is set up really well. Oh, uh, what do you think, Chris? Did you get to see Otis? I saw Otis towards the end. I didn't see him when he arrived. I saw him a couple of days later. Um, I was surprised at how thin he was when I first saw him. But by the time we left, he had put on quite a few pounds and I think he took advantage of um, fishing and, and his nap spot and um, put on some, some extra pounds. I think he'll be fine for the winter. Yeah, I, I, would, I, I agree with that. I think it, winter time Otis is, is going to do pretty well. I think maybe his biggest challenge now is like the springtime season. Springtime when he comes out of the then in early summer. Uh, maybe if he gets to Brooks River earlier next year, we'll see him in a better body condition. Because if you're out walking the landscape for, you know, two or three extra weeks without eating, you know, that's really definitely going to affect your, your overall body mass. But if Otis comes back, in late June or early July, which he had done this year was a, a little bit of an anomaly in that sense. I think we're going to see him uh, return in better condition this year or next year if he comes back earlier uh, compared to this year. But uh, yeah, I definitely think it's the springtime and early summer season that's going to be most challenging for Otis, not necessarily the hibernation period. I think he has enough fat to, to get through hibernation. It's what he can, how, how he's going to cope with the starvation season that's springtime and early summer, that's maybe going to be more difficult for him. Uh, we have, I think, maybe time for one more uh, question. And this one is uh, about, and, and Chris, maybe I'll throw this one to you because you did mention about school students, how, you know, there's a significant number of, of students voting in Fat Bear Week. So then was wonder, wondering since school students 
are now 30% of the vote, probably a lot of students don't vote on the weekends or holidays. Could that be taken into consideration in future fat bear weeks? We have looked at it before. I believe that's part of the reason we did not vote on Sunday this year. And I think that the fact that it Monday was a holiday may have affected it. We saw a drop in the number of votes and when they looked at it, it did show fewer from schools. So uh, I don't know if they changed the week, but it is something we do take into consideration uh, when we look at the numbers. All right, yeah, we're always looking for different ways to improve on Fat Bear Week. And thanks to everybody who has voted this year. As we conclude Fat Bear Week, we hope that you feel a stronger connection to brown bears and salmon in Katmai National Park. Again, people often ask how they can help uh, the wildlife of this amazing place. If you can, please consider a donation to the Otis uh, Matching Fund with the Katmai Conservancy. Katmai Conservancy is the official nonprofit partner of Katmai National Park, friend, uh, official friends group of Katmai. I'm pleased to be a volunteer member on its board of directors. The Conservancy supports the preservation of Katmai by promoting greater public interest, appreciation, and support of the park through education, interpretation, and research. Through October 14, your donations to the Otis Fund will be matched by explore.org. There's already been more than $100,000 donated to the Otis Fund, so thank you to everyone who has done that. You can find out more uh, about the Katmai Conservancy and donate at katmaiconservancy.org. All donations are welcome, but no matter if you can afford to donate to the Otis Fund or not, you can still champion uh, the cause of healthy salmon runs and fat brown bears by supporting efforts to protect their habitat, by talking to other people about this amazing place, and by electing people at all levels of government who will work to tackle the climate crisis and protect wild spaces. Uh, you know, and many rangers uh, work at Brooks Camp during the summertime. We don't have them on our live chats. Uh, we don't have that opportunity. However, uh, as we get close to the end of our broadcast, we do have a special uh, parting message for everybody from the staff at Brooks Camp. Happy Fat Bear Week. Hey everybody, happy Fat Bear Week. 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 And happy Fat Bear Week to everybody. Uh, please uh, join me for a live Fat Bear celebration event with the Catlin Conservancy this Saturday, October 14 at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific. It'll be broadcast live on explore.org. Uh, Rangers, I want to thank you for all of the hard work you put into helping host Fat Bear Week. I know it is a ton of work for you, and it was a bit more stressful this year because you actually didn't know if you were going to be laid off <laughs> until Congress got their act together. I can say that. They can't say that, but I can say that. <laughs> thank, th thank you to, um, uh, to, to you and all of your hard work. I, I do have one final question for both for all of you though. Um, are you ready to retire to a den for the next few months? Uh, Chris, let's start with you. Absolutely, I'm so ready. <laughs> I could use a, a little sleep, I think. So I think they have a good plan. <laughs> hey, Felicia, what about you? <laughs> yeah, I want a nice nap. <laughs> all right. So this two out of three, Naomi, what are you doing? You ener energized or are you ready to sleep? Oh no, fat bear week. Um, I mean, maybe all that fat and salmon get the bears ready for hibernation. Fat bear week gets us ready for a good nap. <laughs> <laughs> well, fat bear week is an opportunity for us to consider the challenges that bears face to survive winter. It allows us to marvel at their success as well as the health and productivity of Katmai's ecosystems. The two Fat Bear Week finalists and all of the Bear and Fat Bear Week really are quintessential examples of success in the supreme adaptations that bears possess to survive. Buck Salmon of Bristol Bay and the bears of Katmai who depend on them represent a beacon of hope in a world that's wounded by mass extinction and human-driven climate change. So let's use them to remind ourselves that all is not lost. There's a lot to save everywhere and for everyone now and in the future if we work together to do so. And I would like to say to everybody, happy Fat Bear Week. And thanks to all of our voters. My name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. My co-hosts for our broadcast today have been Katmai National Park Rangers, Naomi Boak, Chris Kleesrath, and Felicia Jimenez. Until, until we speak with you again, uh, enjoy the bears. 
And as we like to say at explore.org, never stop learning.